The English language contains dozens of words that describe the dog. Yet none alone seems entirely adequate. Loving, loyal, devoted, amusing, spirited, tireless. How they enchant us, delight us, brighten our days and how they work for us. Down through history, no other animal has served us in as many ways. Called by one philosopher, the noblest beast God ever made, the dog is at work on farms and in pastures around the world. Across the forbidding reaches of the frozen north, as comrades on the battlefields of war, seeking even the faintest scent of a buried victim of disaster. hiker who has lost his way. And he is the devoted servant of the ill, elderly, and handicapped. We will never know exactly how this unprecedented partnership came about or when. But one story tells us, in the beginning, God created man. But seeing him so feeble, he gave him the dog. Since 1877, a stylized ritual has been repeated in Manhattan. The Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show, the World Series of Dogdom. Some 2,600 dogs, all purebreds and prize winners in other shows, will compete. Westminster now welcomes 130 breeds and varieties. There are 52 million dogs in the United States. While some romp in the yard or sleep by the fire, others are being carefully primped and primed to take home ribbons. Right, 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 right. Oh, right, right, right. What do you say? Bye. Give me another kiss. Good boy. <laughs> You're a sweetheart. While most show dogs today perform no labor at all outside the arena, historically their ancestors worked side by side with man. In fact, our unique and splendid partnership with the dog began as a working relationship as long as 10 to 15,000 years ago. Over the centuries, many of their jobs became obsolete. One that has continued is tending sheep. In New Zealand, sheep outnumber people 20 to 1, and a saying goes, no dog, no shepherd. No shepherd, no sheep, no sheep, no wool or meat. With dogs at their side, New Zealand farmers now rank second in wool exports and are near the top in meat products. Grant and Robin Calder run a sheep station on New Zealand's South Island. Grant is a champion breeder and trainer of sheepdogs in the tradition of his father and grandfather before him. 
Much of New Zealand is mountainous country, suitable only for grazing. Without the sheepdog, this would be wasteland. Working their 13,000 acre property with no additional hands, the husband and wife team herds 7,500 sheep. It's a fairly unusual partnership that husband and wife work a farm like this together, but thanks to the dogs, we can manage to do it. Without them, we just couldn't do it. A useless farmer could come onto this place with my team of dogs and work out how to work them and actually make a living here. But if you took my dogs away and left me on this place, we would be broken 12 months. Yeah, pup, 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 pup. Come on, I have to give you a name. One of the two types of dogs the Calders breed is called a hunterway. Grant begins training at about three months. Hunterways work the sheep from behind, facing away from the shepherd. It's the first signs of a pup starting to work is to go over there like that and chase those sheep. If I put a string on that pup, the noise would start coming, and that's the makings of a hunterway dog. We've got a few sheep over there. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Even early in the training, a simple tug of the string keeps this pup facing correctly. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. This six-month-old pup is learning not only when to bark, but when to stop once the sheep obey him or the shepherd commands him. Will I go, Danny? Will I go, Danny? Come here. Good boy. That's good. Good boy. Oh, you love it, don't you? The second type, working the Calder sheep, is called a heading dog. They virtually never bark, but control the sheep entirely with their eyes. She tries to mesmerize them. She can introduce herself quietly, looking straight into the sheep's eyes. Twice a year, the Calders round up from the high country 2,500 of their sheep for shearing to send to market, or in this instance, to be dipped to protect their wool. Robin works on a high ridge and Grant is lower down as they and their 10 dogs begin to pull the flock together. Because sheep in New Zealand have no natural enemies, they have never developed a herding instinct and therefore spread far afield. The dogs are tireless and would literally work until they drop. It's not unusual in the course of a day for them to cover up to 50 miles. It's hard to believe how tough dogs are. And on this property, they work in extreme conditions in all types of weather. Even with a dog in those sort of conditions, everything might be against him. He might have cut feet. He might have snowballs built up on him. They will always try and run. They will always try their best to do and complete the job that you put in front of them. Like army sergeants on alert, the dogs keep the flock moving. In one week's time, the remarkable team of two people and their ten steadfast dogs have completed the roundup. Dog's work's never done, and when he finishes on the hill, he comes into the real hard work of slogging in the hot yards. The hotter it gets, the more the sheep put their heads down and won't go. And we tend to only work with one or two dogs in the yard, so we can alternate them so that each dog gets a turn, because it is hot, dry, dusty, dirty work. <coughs> Because of the intense heat, the tired sheep often don't want to move, 
creating traffic jams in the tight confines of the pen. To find the offenders, the dogs simply make a sidewalk out of the backs of the sheep. After a chemical dip for protection against external parasites, the sheep will be set free to wander up to the high country again to graze until the next roundup. And then, once more, when the shepherds head for the hills, their canine partners will be by their sides. The New Zealand farmer and his dog have become a world-famous partnership. Today, more than 200,000 such dogs are on the job across the country. Probably the most photographed is this one, a public tribute to the dogs that help keep the economy so vital and alive. The origins of the domesticated dog lie shrouded in the distant past, but it is generally agreed that the dog evolved from the wolf or that both share a common ancestor. Wolves and dogs have the same basic anatomy, physiology, and patterns of behavior. And underneath the dog's domestic facade lie the instincts of a predatory hunter. Wolves live and hunt in packs, unlike other meat eaters, such as members of the cat family that ambush their prey. Wolves stalk, chase after, and run down prey. However, as the wolf quickly learns, even with the cooperation of the pack, he is no match for an animal as large as a bison. The mainstay of the wolf's diet are animals the size of deer, small moose, or elk. Pack behavior is strictly regulated by a dominance hierarchy understood by all members. In the dog, pack loyalty is basically unaltered even after thousands of years of domestication. The main difference is the dog looks to man as leader of the pack. Modern day scientists have pondered why early man, himself a flesh-eating hunter, would have turned competitors like wolves or wild dogs into allies. Animal behaviorist Dr. Michael Fox, one of the world's leading experts on wolves and dogs, has one explanation for how the partnership may have begun. Well, I feel that dogs and humans came together because of their similarity in lifestyles to the degree that we hunted in small packs, we were gatherer hunters, and the dog-wolf ancestor was like that too. And it's quite probable that the early hunting societies found that dogs were pretty good allies if they were properly socialized to help locate and even ambush prey. Dogs in their long association with us uh, have powers of manipulation. In one sense, we've domesticated them, but they have domesticated us too. We have the situation where the dog will come up and just look at you and look at you, and you have to feed it. Uh, the dog knows how to touch your heart. They have a power in the eye. Some people think that their dogs have ESP, that they know what you're feeling and thinking, but they're acute observers of our body language. You know, or happy or anxious, they're reading all that all the time because that's how they communicate with each other too. In finding out about each other and the rest of the world, smell is the dog's primary tool. It is said their ability to smell is at least 500 times greater than our own. Their hearing too is better than ours, but they see less well and are colorblind. There are 350 recognized breeds of dogs in the world. Regardless of outward differences, they are all the same species. Canis familiaris. 
Their wide diversity in appearance can often be explained by the work humans have bred dogs to do. In the language of his native Germany, Dachshund means badger dog. His short, stubby legs and narrow body made him ideal for squeezing into burrows after prey. Terriers, too, were bred small and low to the ground, so they could plunge into dark holes in pursuit of rats or foxes. The name terrier comes from the Latin word terra, or earth. Whippets and greyhounds are long-legged and sleek because they were bred for hunting and racing. Firehouse mascots today, Dalmatians, were companions to charioteers in ancient times. In Elizabethan England, they gained fame as coach dogs with a calming effect on the horses. The regal Chow Chow boasts a 2,000 year history in China as hunter and guard. For centuries, dogs have helped man hunt. Today, we've made them highly specialized. Pointers only point, nose high, body frozen in place. And retrievers only retrieve, joyfully leaping into even frigid waters to bring back their quarry. From predatory wild animals, we have created, regardless of breed, the most adaptable and sociable of all domesticated animals. It is not precisely known when we first put dogs to work as entertainers, but one of the most famous, adored by countless millions, is Lassie. Bob Weatherwax, son of the original Lassie trainer, is now preparing the seventh generation Lassie for an upcoming television series. Hey, come on! To get the seven dogs who have actually appeared on the screen, Bob and Rudd Weatherwax had to breed more than 200 collies to get just the right coloration, intelligence, and temperament. On screen, the Lassie character has always been a female. But in reality, all lassies have been male collies because males tend to have a more luxuriant coat and greater stamina. The lassie legend began in the 1940s with a dog named Pal. Originally, Lassie MGM hired their own collie to do Lassie, and it was a female dog, which is what Eric Knight wrote the story around because it had to have puppies. And my father's dog was hired as a double dog, and it was a male collie called Pal. And I think he knew that the other dog couldn't do this performance. And they had a spot where Lassie just come from Scotland back to England. And he had to cross a river, and it's a nice scene. The genius of Rudd Weatherwax came through in this scene, in which he taught Lassie to look naturally exhausted, as if it weren't a trick at all. of the dog, no matter how bright he may be, cannot conceptualize, look tired. But the dog can obey a series of off-screen commands, given in a specific order, that result in the tired look the audience sees. Sweet. Stay. Stay. That's your boy, stay. Compared to many dogs that bring a large measure of instinct to their work, dog actors start out as a blank slate. Because they are intelligent, they are capable of learning. The motivation to learn, the willingness to behave in such undog-like ways, is based simply on the dog's desire for human praise. 
dog's man's best friend. I think they're the most domesticated of all animals, and they want to please. They want to be with man. It's like A for effort. They'll give you that effort. All right, come on. Hop. The Earth's ice-locked polar regions could never have been explored without dogs. In the early 1900s, sled dog teams brought Peary to the North Pole and Amundsen to the South. When northern regions were settled, dogs became an essential part of life. Until the advent of airplanes and snowmobiles, dogs alone transported mail and supplies, pulled sleds, took hunters in search of prey. Today in Alaska, the pioneering spirit of that earlier time is celebrated in a grueling 1,100-mile race. Beginning in Anchorage and ending in Nome, it covers a distance roughly the same as from Seattle to Los Angeles. Its name, Iditarod, is said to come from the trail that was once the lifeline linking far-flung villages in the interior. Two-time champion of what is called the last great race on earth is 33-year-old Susan Butcher, a world-class athlete and now a celebrity. She is going for an unprecedented third consecutive win. She hopes to beat her 11-day record and take home the $30,000 first prize. I've been racing in the Iditarod for 10 years now, and I think over all the years, I've been basically in the top 10. And I think that all comes from my training ability with the dogs and the time that I spend with them and the conditioning that I put on them. And then the rest has to be up to the dogs. I've got good dogs. And I bred them and raised them purely for long distance racing. In 1975, when she moved to America's last frontier, the adventuresome 20-year-old first lived in a tent, then single-handedly built a log cabin. She was 30 miles from her nearest neighbors, 50 miles from the nearest road. She started out with only three dogs, and today has a breeding kennel with 130. Susan raises only Alaskan Huskies, a line bred from Eskimo and Indian dogs. Well, I changed the teams around today, David. Susan runs Trail Breaker Kennel with her husband, yep. David Munson, himself a champion racer. I was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but I've always felt I was born in the wrong century and in the wrong place. And so I kept moving north and west, and I've always loved animals, and they've been the most important thing in my life. And so I was looking to incorporate living in the wilderness and working with dogs, and I found the perfect thing. Where's your babies? Who are they? Are you okay? Are you? In the early days of sled dog racing, Hello. breeding was often a haphazard matter. But Susan Butcher knows that good racing dogs don't just happen without careful planning. Every summer, I raise a number of puppies, between 50 and 100 pups. And I'll pick out two of my best dogs. Usually, if I have a very fast dog, but maybe it doesn't have a good enough coat, I'll breed it to one with a good coat. But the most important thing is that they have bred into them the desire to pull and the desire to travel. And travel they do, every day, with either Susan or her dog handler. These four-month-old pups are learning that running is fun and that being with people is fun. Every fall is a really exciting time for me and for the dogs. As the temperatures get colder, we just develop a certain excitement towards winter. When it starts to get cold, the dogs just start making a lot of noise, running around their chains. They're just antsy. They want to get going. They just show me in many ways that they're ready to roll, ready for the racing season. 
All the adult dogs are run three to four times a week throughout the year. As with all athletes, conditioning is vital to their performance. When snow cover is too thin to be safe for the sled, the dogs pull an all-terrain vehicle left in neutral gear. Like a coach with marathon runners, Susan gradually increases the length of the runs. Her goal is 50 miles without tiring. The dogs, never more happy than when on the trail, joyfully oblige. Twelve to sixteen hours a day, the routine seldom varies. The culmination in March, the chance to compete in the most punishing race on earth. The mushers, as sled dog drivers are called, brave temperatures that can drop to 40 below. Except for one mandatory 24-hour rest stop, they may sleep only an hour or so each day, and only after the dogs are tended and fed. potentially treacherous at every turn. In 1985, a moose attacked Susan's dogs, forcing her out of the race. On the last leg of the race, along the frozen Bering Sea, mushers encounter the most severe weather. It is Susan Butcher's 10th day out, and she is trailing, as she has for most of the race. A violent storm has forced temperatures to plunge. Swirling snow has obliterated much of the trail. Both Susan and the dogs are pushed to the limit of their endurance. The storm has thwarted her nearest competitors, who have stopped to wait it out. Undaunted, Susan Butcher charges on. Expectant crowds gather. The ham radio operator at the last checkpoint has reported that the first musher might reach the finish line at any time. In 11 days, 11 hours, and 42 minutes, a jubilant but exhausted Susan Butcher becomes the first person ever to win the Iditarod three consecutive times. Susan is a full 14 hours ahead of any other musher. Some will not cross the finish line for several more days. Amazingly, Susan could have made even better time than she did, if she had wanted. She put the safety and well-being of the dogs above all else. It was a matter of either go for a record competing against only um, Father Time and no other um, musher, <coughs> and um, possibly take more out of the team than I, I like to, or just to take good care of the team and, and be well satisfied with a victory, and I thought that that sounded a lot safer. Susan and racing enthusiasts everywhere know the real tribute belongs to the bravery, love, and indomitable spirit of these magnificent dogs. On an ordinary street in an ordinary California town, a drama, anything but ordinary, is quietly unfolding. 17-year-old Mike Knowlton was born with spina bifida, a disabling birth defect of the spine that occurs in one to two out of every thousand babies born in the United States. Good girl. Good girl. Okay. Oh, yes. Yes. Are you ready for more money? Mike must be cared for by his parents, Joy and Dale Knowlton, for he is totally paralyzed from the chest down. Mike walked on his own for many years. Then, without warning, his condition worsened. The last time he was walking was right about here. And at that point in time, he had to have support from one of us to move his legs. When 
We were told he was paralyzed and a wheelchair was going to be with him the rest of his life. Michael went into a depression for about two years. It was very hard for him to adjust. Now a dog has come into Mike's life and the depression has lifted. Her name is Zest. Zest has made a major change. If I didn't have her, I don't know what I would do. She just really helps me a lot. A unique organization called Canine Companions for Independence, or CCI, brought Mike and Zest together. Using dogs to guide the blind is a well-known success story. CCI pioneered the idea that dogs could also help the wheelchair-bound. During an intensive two-week training program, students master 89 commands. No, don't touch it. For their safety, as well as the dogs and the publics, they must gain total control over the animal's actions. CCI instructors have spent six months training the dogs. All right. Get him happy, everybody. One of the most important jobs is retrieving. Look, pet it, bring it here. Good. Keys are especially difficult because of their uneven edges and dogs dislike the taste of metal. All right, good boy. Because they will be going home to very diverse environments, the teams are put into as many real life situations as possible during the two week course. Today, on a college campus, the dogs encounter some other dogs that at first they think are real. The kind of things you guys need to anticipate. No, it's going to come up. These things happen all the time. Okay, Jess. The most frustrating part was having them tell me to have the dog do something, and the dog wouldn't do it, and they wouldn't tell me how to get the dog to do it. But my biggest thing was, would I be able to make it through the two weeks? Because I kind of had doubts. Go off, Jess. No, Jess. Jess. She should come to you, not go around behind there. She doesn't understand that concept. Okay, so uh, what I do to get her... You need to do what you need to take yeah. care of yourself and your dog. I gotta start over again. The sheer physical exertion would cause some to simply give up. But Mike is determined. Finally, he and Zest are successful. Even for those with the use of their arms, fatigue is a major factor that often keeps them housebound. Dogs are a wonderful solution, for they will pull tirelessly. At the end of the two weeks, the last hurdle is the final exam. Of the more than 300 teams that have gone through CCI since it began in 1975, 90% of dogs and humans have passed. With well-deserved pride, the class arrives for graduation, threshold to their new independence. As you can see, this is quite a loving team. And throughout their lives, there's always going to be a lot of love and commitment on the part of these two. Mike worked very hard in this class, and so did Zest. And congratulations to both of you. All CCI graduates report a dramatic rise in self-esteem because of the dog's role as icebreaker. People who normally feel awkward approaching a person in a wheelchair do not feel uncomfortable in the presence of the dog. I'm real shy, and the last couple of months, it seems like it's easier to go up to people because most of the time, people come up to her, and then I kind of get into the conversation. So it helps me to get to know people. We didn't realize that kind of a bond could be between a dog and a, and a person. It really gives us a different perspective we didn't realize that the dog could do as much for Michael's emotions as this dog has done. Okay, Jess. Come here. 
Jess, I draw a look. I draw a twit, Jess. I draw a tap it. Tap it. Come on, come on, walk. Oh, okay, Jess. Come on. I draw a go to bed. A boy needing help and a loving canine at his side. Perhaps nowhere is the age-old covenant between man and dog more poignantly felt than here. In Northern California, one man remembers a partnership with dogs that many people have never even heard of. For the 13 months he served in Europe during World War II, Joe Simpson fought alongside a dog. They were one of the earliest teams in what was known as the Canine Corps. In 1942, the um, Canine Corps was formed by a group of civilians from the New England Dog Training Club. And Dogs for Defense was formed at the same time. And they picked 14 GIs out of 5,000 volunteers. And fortunately, I was one of the 14 picked not because I knew anything about dogs necessarily, but because I was in the horse business. And this is how I got started in the Canine Corps. Patriotic families everywhere across America volunteered their dogs to help the war effort. Rovers, Spots, and Fidos of all descriptions were sent off to an uncertain future in the Army, Marines, or Coast Guard. Like their human counterparts, all dogs were examined for fitness. Any new man that came in got a new dog. And they taught us to make the dog heel and sit and down and stay and all the obedience commands. And these dogs then went through the training with the master. And then when that was through, certain ones that were fit for attack training, if they had enough aggressiveness in them, were put into attack classes. And the dogs that were better for messenger work were trained for that. Some dogs were trained for pack dogs. So it was quite a course. In Europe, dogs were used in World War I. But this was our first use of them in combat. Some 10,000 served in many of the bloodiest battles across Europe and the South Pacific. If we needed to send a message back to the forward outpost, we had a messenger caller that we'd put the message in and put it around the dog. And the dog had to learn that when this caller was on him, he was to run as fast as he could back to the other master. Messenger dogs had to develop equal loyalty to two masters because they worked by going from one to the other. To ignore the noise and flames from exploding shells was hardest to teach. The dogs didn't have to reach up and tap us on the shoulder to tell us there was some Germans over there. We knew by watching our dog and being able to read the dog. This is very important with anyone working a dog. If you can read the dog, then you'll know what the dog is trying to tell you. And I owe my life to my dog, and I'm sure a lot of the other handlers would say the same thing. Joe Simpson was one of many who brought their dogs home after the war. Intensive demilitarization programs retrained the animals before they were allowed to return to civilian life as the gentle and loving pets they had originally been. One phase of training similar to that for war dogs is used in search and rescue work. More than 70 such groups now exist across the United States. All volunteers, they work alongside law enforcement teams in wilderness rescues and the aftermath of disasters. Go through? No, 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 no cheat. It takes hundreds of hours of training before a team can be sent on a mission. Go through. Early on, a dog often needs to be coaxed. Okay, try that way again. Want to go through? Go. Go through all the way. Oh, good girl. Good girl. Okay. 
What handlers look for is not the breed itself, many breeds are used, but qualities like intelligence, curiosity, and self-confidence. The dogs must be taught agility so they can safely negotiate boulders and other obstacles in the woods, as well as piles of disaster rubble. Lion. Shirley Hammond is both a handler and a trainer. What we do is we start the dogs out very young, if we can, uh, although we can start older dogs, teaching them uh, on an agility course. We do a lot of ladder climbing with the dogs, and this teaches them to use their back feet. Their back feet just normally follow their front feet, and they do not develop a knowledge of back feet unless they're taught to do something, feeling what they're putting it on and feeling for stability with it. Good dog, Tasha! This 12-week-old puppy confronts a ladder for the first time. In addition to the obstacle course, they train on a rubble pile that simulates a disaster area. The uniform and helmet signal to Shirley's dog, Cinnamon, that now they are working. Mm -hmm. Trained not to follow her instincts to jump off the unstable boards, Cinnamon zigzags across the rubble in what is known as air scenting, trying to pick up the victim's scent on the air currents. She has been trained to cover the entire area thoroughly. Once the victim, in this case a volunteer, has been found, the dog's job is to scratch and bark to alert the handler to the area with the most intense scent. Can we put that one back up? Is he there? Oh, look up there! What do you find, Sam? Finding the victim is the dog's primary reward. It is essential that physical contact be made so the dog knows she's done her job well. Oh, you found him! You've got him where you job. want him now, boy. Yeah, I got him where I want him. That was good. Did you find him, huh? That was a good search. Oh, my God. In 1985, Shirley and Cinnamon were one of 13 U.S. search dog teams that made a vital contribution in a real-life disaster, a devastating earthquake that racked Mexico City. The soft subsoils underlying the city and inadequate building codes were blamed when hundreds of buildings collapsed. Thousands were injured, thousands more left homeless as many as 10,000 died. It was really hard to believe because there were buildings standing that, with glass and beautiful structures that were just pancaked to the floor. This is the building that was 11, 12, 14 stories. Suddenly it's down to 10, 20, 30 feet high because some of them actually sank down into their basements. They went that far down. In you go. 12 hours a day for a week, the team searched through the twisted rubble. Hundreds of people surely lay trapped, but where? And could the dogs find any of them in time? They cock their head and listen with their ears as if maybe they might even be able to hear the victims after they would bark, as if they were kind of calling to them by their barking. And the other side of that coin, of course, is when they did locate someone buried under the rubble that was gone, deceased. It was a very low-key reaction, just a little pawing and a little whining. Amazingly, even at week's end, victims were found still clinging to life. <laughs> Only hours old when the quake hit, this baby was trapped for nine days. Doctors cannot easily explain her survival. Others see it simply as a gift from God. The next
Mexican people were just wonderful to us, and it was a, a warm, warm feeling. They were so appreciative of our being there, and it was really a very unique position to know that you were doing something that was helpful and that your dog was able to do it. And it's a feeling that says, this is what we've done it for. All the times we've been wet, we've been cold, we've been tired, we've been hot. Uh, this is real, and it's so exciting, so exciting. Many thousands of years ago, some long-forgotten caveman welcomed a wild animal into his home to share his fire and food. Through the centuries, the dogs that evolved have remained our enduring helpmates and unfaltering friends. Our own success as a species is due in no small measure to the fact that a canine partner has been by our side. Intelligent and loyal beyond measure, dogs ask little from us in return for their unquestioning devotion. In fact, most dogs do not see work as work, but thrive on serving us simply for the praise of a job well done. In commenting on this age-old partnership, one author has written, we give them the love we can spare, the time we can spare, the room we can spare. In return, dogs have given us their absolute all. It is, without a doubt, the best deal man has ever made.